It's time for Class Racing Today, the podcast for the NHRA Class Racing fan. Welcome back to Class Racing Today, classracingtoday.com. This episode, once again, brought to you by Tim Stickles Gutters by Design. Now serving Seacoast, New Hampshire, Southern Maine, and Massachusetts. Offering the industry's premier gutter system. Their 5-inch channel scratch guard finish that comes with a lifetime warranty. Uh, call today for your free estimate, 603-953-4640, 603-953-4640. Thanks, Tim, for supporting Class Racing today in this episode. Um, I, I think last week, Brian, when we were here, uh, it was raining, and so you had no excuse not to be here. So it's still raining again. Uh, how's it going today? I think it rains every day now, it seems like. <laughs> like <clears throat> It's kind of wild. I... Uh, it just keeps raining and raining and raining. Mm-hmm. But race season's over, and I uh, made a little progress. I dropped my motor off at a not very secret speed laboratory in Wright, Minnesota, so I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> not very secret. <laughs> what are you up to, Bobby? What did you do this weekend? Enjoyed the sun. Walked on the beach, didn't do anything related to racing, unfortunately. So it's my stalker's still broken. Super stalker's in the trailer. I'm done for the year as far as driving my cars. And hopefully come back next year and be ready to go. We're going to have to do a live from the Jersey Shore episode if it's going to rain here and be sunny there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go out to Pomona, though, and run the national event in somebody else's car. Um, another Mustang like mine, stick shift, super stock L car. So we'll see how that goes. I'm looking forward to that. Sounds like it's going to be a good time and hopefully more sun out there. Is there only two of those in the country? We need to talk to Nitro Joe and see how many of those cars are actually out there. Cause I don't think I've ever seen another one other than yours. No, I think actively right now it's just mine and this car out on the West coast. There were a couple more before they all got sold and they're like, I don't know, just sitting just sitting around. Joe, you're gonna have to let us know how many com- how many of those are out there because I, like I said, I that's one of those good combinations that nobody else is out trying to wreck it. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of those dumb combinations that nobody's stupid enough to run. Well, yeah, but you know, Ford tried. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's ouch. on the coolometer, meter as Alan Reinhardt says every time he puts me up high on the coolometer. meter. So at least, you know, if something bad happens, at least I got that going for me. Is that like Top Gear's cool wall? Yeah, he always like he he's he'll like talk up cars. Usually it's like cool, like, oh, this is a 68, you know, Hemi. This is on the cool meter or a 70 Dodge Charger 446 pack cool meter. And then I come up with the little 65 Mustang 289, and then he throws me up on the cooler meter with those big, you know, big muscle cars. I guarantee he's never said that about a 2000 Camaro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, somebody's lost looking for ice cream. <laughs> Why are they driving up the track? No, probably not. But he said enough times, oh, the 2000 Camaro wins the day. So you got that going for you. I hope so. I'm pretty excited about my new horsepower options. Uh, you're going to be making a ton of horsepower. You, you brought it to the right lab, so I'm excited for you. The, you have uh, to see it up for me. Let me drive it. I, uh, <laughs> I've never like... I always have to put that part in front of a driving <laughs> request. It always has to be, move the seat up for me, and then let me drive it. Yeah, just don't touch my blinders. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Has that story been told yet on the show? <laughs> I got in Brian's car. I was like, what is you need? I was, I don't remember. I was like, oh, you're you get in there and you like, up. he can barely see over the steering wheel. So he's like this, like, oh, this is cool. I'm like, man, this is sitting like in a cockpit. And he's I was like, like, what, what is like, this oh, thing no, up here by the sun visor? He just completely throws my blinder out of like alignment. And this is like, I thought the whole point of a blinder is you get up there and you like adjust it as you're pre staging and you move it. And his was like, cemented jb welded in place and you can't like touch it don't breathe too hard what if you're in the other lane like, what if- they're both set perfectly 
because see, my car actually launches hard, <laughs> so they move when you launch. So I want those things yeah. like. Okay. I've lost two finals last year because my blinder wasn't in the right spot. So those I don't touch them. It's Oops. like lucky rabbit's foot to not touch them. But it's not like it really harmed you that week. No, somehow magically it just went right back to the right spot. But oh. I was really paranoid about it. Like I'm, I probably had a crappy like twenty light because I was so worried about <laughs> not having my blinder in the right spot. Oh my god! Oh brother! That's why I went red in the final or the quarterfinals uh-huh. that day, Bobby, because you moved my blinder. Yep, I know. The day before. Fault. I set him up. Sabatucci. The, yeah. P- the PMR guys put him up to it. <laughs> well, Coolometer, the guest car today is definitely on the Coolometer, even though it's a pretty common car, but it's like one of the nicest ones ever. So we'll put it we'll put it up there. I remember doing a driver interview on this fella, and I said, can we take a peek inside? And he had me open the door. I was like, I'm not, I don't want to touch this thing. I might have a speck of you know chicken grease on my fingers here and then what i'm not gonna feel right here well that's because at that time shut the he had me shut the door too and i was like you know i already don't slam doors but i was i was nervous he he made me nervous at at that time he didn't know you got inside and started fiddling with stuff (laughs) he got me he gave me way too much responsibility around this nice car so anyways for anybody uh wondering this is the 1968 camaro superstock g automatic of 20 year old Wyatt Wagner. Wyatt, how's it going? Good. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. I didn't get any fingerprints or mess up any door hinges on that car of yours, did I? No, you didn't. You did a good job, but Brian, he could set in it because there's no br- blinders to move around in there. <laughs> <laughs> See, Brian, he's got natural talent. He doesn't need to block and blind and whatever. He, he's also young enough. He has lots of free time to race. <laughs> No wife, no kids. He's in school though, and he's working. I mean, he's a he's an all around he's an all around guy. We only like to have all around people on this uh, on this show. So, Wyatt, tell us a little bit about what you do. Where do you go to school? Uh, right now, I'm going to um, KU as well as Johnson County, which is a community college. Um, my um, major is business finance. Uh, right now, I'm a sophomore, so that's kind of what I spend. Oh, some of my time, probably half my time or most of my time even doing. And then um, when I'm not doing that, uh, I work at, work at our shop, Wagner's Classic Cars. Uh, so between those two things and going around racing, it kind of makes for a pretty busy schedule. No, oh, yeah. So you're a busy man. All right. That's that's cool. And do um, you ever bring the car over to school and like show it off to the uh, – the girls running around or what? I mean, <laughs> oh, no, it usually just sets some projects with the car cover and until we get it out. And then... Oh, missed opportunity there, pal. I'm just yeah. letting you know. <laughs> He's going to put it on the open trailer and take it to school next time. <laughs> he should. I'm telling you, I'm, 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 I'm giving him pearls right now. He's not listening. So it's a 68 Camaro super stock G automatic 350, 295 advertised and would you say it was rated at it's rated at 313 and then 318 with aluminum heads all right so what do you uh oem or aluminum heads oem it's 313 for me all right how much does the car have to weigh then uh 2985 2985 all right so you won a couple of uh you won a couple divisionals last year right and now this year you snagged your first national event yeah, well, let's see, I won a couple of divisionals a couple of years ago, and then I guess the start of this year kind of didn't really start how I wanted and didn't have a whole lot of luck. And then uh, I guess later in the year, I just kind of started to click and started to win a few rounds. And yeah, I won the Topeka National event, and then a couple weeks ago, I won St. Louis Division Race. So it didn't start very good, but it ended pretty good. So I'm pretty happy. How cool is that to win your first national in Topeka? It was pretty neat. Um, I'm, that's where I made my first runs when I was eight years old in the junior dragster. So to be able to win there and in front of, you know, people you know and stuff like that, it, it was pretty cool. That's pretty much your home track, isn't it? Yeah, Topeka's um, only 45 minutes from our shop. So, yeah, I race there all the time for the past, I guess, 12 years or so. 
but that wasn't uh, probably a little bit of a letdown then at the end of the day. In Topeka? Yeah. Why is that? Oh, when you go through, is that where you got teched? Is that Topeka? No. No. No, at Topeka, I was actually racing um, by myself. That was one of the only times I've ever raced without my dad. And so um, that was a little different weekend for me, but we were able to, you know, be on the phone with each other all the time and uh, talk about stuff. So you guys are it was pretty, basically like he was there. You guys are pretty much together all the time. I mean, that's going to be a pretty cool part. Yeah, we uh, we usually don't go anywhere without each other. What was, did he have to work that and, weekend yeah. or? How come he wasn't able to be there? Do you have to? Uh, yeah, he, he actually was actually taking my sister to school in Florida, and I guess originally I was supposed to go with him to Florida to take her, and it just worked out where I decided to stay and run that. I mean, home national event and everything. So, um, you know, running a big race like that by myself, you know, it was a little different. But I had some help that weekend, and obviously still on the phone with him. So it's a uh, I don't know. I just kind of, I guess, did what he he's taught me to do since we started racing when I was eight, and did it just like you know he would do it if he was there, and that all worked out. So it was a good weekend. You took out a killer in the final too, didn't you? Take out Justin Lamb that day. Yeah, it was me and Lamb in the final. Got a little lucky, but I guess that's what it takes. Oh yeah, you don't have to tell me that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but now that's good. I mean, you 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 earned it. You know, you you take out some killers along the way. And I just think it makes it even that more, you know, rewarding. Um, so good for you, man. Let's let's talk about the car a little bit. So the uh, engine, as we said, three fifty. Who builds who builds the engines? Uh, Gary Sennett does all our work. Um, ever since we got our car, he's completely gone through the engine multiple times, and uh, everything he does and everything we you know do as far as engine wise is recommended by him and and done by him. So. Uh, that's just who we trust and and that's who we like to use and and you know we do run stock and super stock you know but our main thing really is consistency and reliability and longevity and uh we definitely get that from him as well as performance so uh, we like to be able to run them a long time and and run them pretty hard so we're pretty happy with uh what he does yeah that's good i mean uh you are definitely um in the performance aspect doing very well you won class at indy i mean that's that's no easy task right no, it's pretty so cool. you are getting longevity and and performance like you said that's right it's it's a pretty tough balance to get but there's a lot of guys that do have it but it's still pretty tough to get but uh you know we, we're, we're definitely not a uh, top of the pack runner as far as you know on the qualifying sheet but we do pretty good and and uh, and, uh have a consistent car and it makes a pretty good race car for race day. So we're pretty happy. What do you run for a transmission? Who does those? Um, this winter or last year. So this was our first year. We put a Cohen XLT three speed in it. Um, before then we just had a power glide in it and they ran really good too, but uh, we decided to go a little faster and uh, that definitely helped. So yeah, our transmission and converters, um, all Cohen stuff. How much did the three speed pick up from the power glide? Um, well, that was kind of the reason for a long time that we didn't. Some people said it would pick you up. Some people said it didn't. Um, I mean, it's as far as what it did for us, it's really no secret. I mean, it picked us up. I, I wouldn't say a tenth, but I'd say a good six or seven hundredths. Yeah, I thought it'd be more than that because that was a huge rule change in stock eliminator where you had to run the transmission, you know, that came in the car maximum number of forward speeds and yeah. now you're allowed to run you know three speeds metrics and things that only came with two speed power glides they didn't change the index they didn't mess with the horsepower rating they just said you could do that that was like a like a a gigantic rule change that kind of just flew under the radar right there yeah so. that's kind of the reason the car we had had a power glide in it um actually our old car um looks just like the one we had now um we, we ran super g and h automatic and you know back then we had to run a power glide because that's what was in the rules and we were running against a lot of corvettes and um, chevy twos which could run three speeds so um it was pretty tough and but you know now that they kind of leveled the playing field it, it makes it a lot easier 
So now you are, after your win, number 14 in the world here in Superstock. Uh, according to my notes, you've hit four nationals and seven divisionals. So you're allowed to claim, you know, you're allowed to hit two more nationals and one more divisional before you're all claimed out. What What are your plans? Oh, yeah, we kind of, we kind of thought about it and thought about going out West. Um, but we just decided to, I guess, call it a year and regroup and, and start again next year. Um, we just don't really have the time to spend three weeks out in Vegas and Pomona, so. But that's all right. We'll uh, hopefully we can do a you know have a better year next year where it's good start to finish, not just at the very end. Which that's really <laughs> what it takes to to do you know top ten or top five or even have a chance at the world. So it's not very good when you have to wait till the last third of the season to have any success. Now I, I don't have your divisional points up in front of me. Do you know where you are in in your division? Um, I think I'm second or third. Um, one of those two, I can't remember. Okay. So I know Scott Burton's leading. He's leading stock and super stock in division five. All right. Wow. So you, you will have the two digit number next year, but you already have one this year too, don't you? Yeah, it's 53 right now. So I'll just, have, I guess if it is 53 now, I'm not quite sure. I'll just leave it on there, I guess. <laughs> But you want to be 52, right? Because what do you, uh, the money, I think divisional money only goes to first and second, right? Or does third get a little bit too? Yeah, I think, I think third gets it because I got some last year. So, I mean, it's not very much, but it's still something. Yeah, right. We'll take it. Yeah, definitely. So how long have you been driving this car? Um, we've had this car since 2015. Uh, when I was 15 years old, we actually got the car. And over that winter, we like, when we got the car, it was black and we uh, – redid it and my dad did most of it and uh, we turned it into the orange car now and that next summer he raced it um, and then when I turned 16 I ended up getting in it and driving it the next year so and that was the year I won the division championship um, when I was well so I guess turning 17 which was three years ago so how much did he raise stock super stock for a long time or just kind of started it when we got this car? Or how did, how did he get well, started? Well, um, his main thing, he, I guess started in the nineties when they started, you know, super gas and super gas started getting big. Um, we still have a Tim McAmis 57 Chevy. Um, that's what he ran super gas in and it, it's just setting right now, but, uh, that's what he got to start in. And then actually, um, a, Actually, one of his good buddies, um, Jason Tinberg, which is from our town, um, some of the stock super stock guys know him, um, had a 68 Camaro. And I guess long story short, he needed it painted. And my dad offered to paint it um, orange with our logo on it for, you know, there was a few other things involved in that deal. But that's how we got our start in super stock uh, when he decided to build a G new GT Cavalier in I think 2006 or 2007. Um, he wanted to sell the um, Camaro and it was already orange with our name on it. So my dad ended up with it and that's uh, kind of how we got our start in Superstock. So 2007, 2008 ish, something like that. So why orange you get to pick the color? Just that's what you started with. That's why the new one. Yeah. So our race cars have always been orange um, since the sixties when my grandpa started racing orange and yellow have always been our colors. Um, so you know, so every, all his cars were orange. All my dad's cars have always been orange. So I guess that's just what we like, I guess. It doesn't feel like a one of our race cars if it's not orange. <laughs> so what do you do at the shop? Like, how'd that get started? Um, that started in 68. Um, my grandpa started it then. And at that time, um, it wasn't called Wagner's Classic Cars because it really wasn't, you know, classic cars in 68 because they were new. <laughs> But, right. um, it was just cars then. <laughs> yeah, they were just cars. So in 68, it was just like a, it was a body shop and um, um, like a car lot and all that stuff. So all your 68 Camaros, 69 Camaros, Mustangs, Mopars, all that stuff were just used cars sitting out on the lot. And uh, I guess over time, it kind of evolved and turned into um, classic car stuff, which is our main deal now. So we spend a lot of time going to Meekum, Barrett Jackson, Lake, um, those kind of deals as far and as long or as far as uh, online classic car sales, stuff like that. Then we also have a um, body shop 
um, collision repair stuff. And then, um, and then pro, like we do a lot of pro touring, um, 69 Camaro, you know, Corvette, that kind of stuff. We stick to GM as far as our high end pro touring builds, which um, is one thing that we've done for a long time too. So you do like full restorations, then a guy can bring the car in, drop it off and come pick it up. And it looks like Lynn Ingalls is a gold Corvette when it leaves. Yep. That's, that's uh, one example of, yeah, what it looks like when it leaves. Pretty amazing. I I haven't been to your shop, but I know that car is just, you hate to even walk by it because your shadow might make a look bad. It's just, that thing is just gorgeous. Yeah, we do. Um, we do a lot of, um, um, just regular restorations on cars and stuff, but the number of high end pro touring type stuff that we do, we try to keep, um, somewhat low because they just take so much time to do. Um, I think we'll probably only do two or three a year. Um, they're just so labor intensive and take so long and, uh, take so much money. You really can't just afford to, you know, bring them in and out and still, and still turn out a good product. So yeah, we, we, um, try to only do stuff for as far as that kind of stuff for people we know and, and that kind of stuff for people that we know of. And, uh, and it seems to be a good combination to turn out a pretty cool piece when it's done. So do you do all the mechanical side too, then it's not just auto body, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a mechanic, mechanic shop and all that kind of stuff too. So when we get a car in, whether it's classic or, or new, it goes through the shop and just make sure it's ready for, I guess, whoever buys it. So you just upholstery too. You guys no, do. we don't we don't get into any upholstery stuff. We have all that done for us. Um, as far as just a regular classic car or in uh, interior stuff, so We're a here. lot of the interiors on the cars we do, as far like is the pro touring stuff, are pretty high end. So um, I think on the last one we've used Paul Atkins, which is a renowned interior guy, as far as the pro touring stuff down in Alabama and. And uh, so we try to use guys like that, turn out a pretty cool interior, just something than, you know, just having a basic stock interior in a super high end car. So how did you, you started in the junior dragsters and in your, when you went to drag racing, right? Yeah. When I was eight, um, I started in junior dragsters. We had a dragster built. And I guess I was a little different than most kids who race junior dragsters. Um, to be honest, I didn't, race a whole lot um when i was growing up i played a lot of uh baseball and traveled basically all over the country doing that so i guess racing was just something i did when i had an extra weekend or something like that um so really i i probably only raced probably when i was 10 and then up until i was 14 or 15 i only raced probably two or three times a year maybe a little more than that but not a whole lot um, so I guess I wasn't out there racing as much as a lot of kids my age who are, are racing now. But, uh, when I was 16, I decided I had enough of baseball and I played that long enough and I was ready to go racing. So, uh, that's what we did. What position were you? Um, I, I pitched quite a bit. Um, played, I pitched and played third base. I was, that was what I, uh, Played most of the time, yeah. So, like, all-star teams, Legion, what did you – and school team? Were you just doing it all? Yeah, I played um, a course for the high school when I was in high school. Um, we just played competitive travel baseball. We went to New York and Florida and Texas, you know, all over the place. And I guess basically doing what we do racing now, but in baseball. <laughs> to be honest, we probably went more places playing baseball than we do racing, so – it was a fun part of my life, but uh, I'm excited of the new chapter, and I like what I'm doing now, so I'm happy. That wouldn't be a very hard decision for me because I don't really sport. But, uh, hey, do you want to play baseball and run around these bases, or do you want to run a just a wicked fast stocks or a super stocker? Like, yeah. Yeah, it was, really, it was something I guess I never even questioned. Um, my dad always coached me growing up, and we just kind of had a – I guess an agreement that really wasn't even an agreement that we'll play baseball and we'll race when we have time to race, which I guess is good because you can't play baseball and basketball when you're 30 years old, but you can 
always drive a race car when you're 30 years old. So I was, I guess I'm happy. I chose what I did and did what I did then. And, and then, uh, I'm doing what I do now. So it all worked out pretty good. So do you do just strictly NHRA stuff or you went to some of the big money stocker races this year, didn't you? Yeah, I went to, uh, Tyler's race in St. Louis, which was awesome. Tyler's a good buddy of mine. And, um, that was probably one of my favorite races of the year. Uh, the weather didn't hurt it. <laughs> that was the fastest race I've ever been to. So, uh, that was fun, but yeah, we stick to stock and super stock or I guess just super stock really. Um, we really don't bracket race a whole lot. It's hard to do everything and, you know, do a full NHRA schedule and bracket race and still try to do everything we need to do here. So, uh, super stock keeps up a good amount of our time, but yeah, we had a dragster. We did a little big bucks bracket racing last year, not a whole lot. And then, uh, that car sold to the Jegs team. So that's where it went. So we're just down to our, uh, super stocker now. Nice. Yeah. I definitely hope they do more of those races. I, it sounds like Bo is going to do another one. I think Tyler would like to do another one. I just hope that people, uh, keep, people keep supporting that. Cause it's just, uh, it's a nice addition. I mean, the NHRA is kind of the backbone, but it's nice for some of these offshoots, you know, even like the NM and the MCA race deal coming up now, you know, where they've been doing it, but hopefully that continues to grow. I just, I think the more options and the more more places to go is just going to help grow the sport. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, the, the class racing stuff that Tyler did and Bo does, I think that's great. Um, I would have liked to have gone to both this year, but the scheduling where they were, I think back to back weekends, um, didn't really help, but, uh, I, hopefully next year they can kind of get together and maybe if they're both planning on doing it, um, kind of decide two good weekends that where people who want to go to both could, go to both and not be on the road for two or three weeks going from Georgia to St. Louis to back home. Yeah. The early one in the spring was just a little, like I said, Butner's race for us up here was just a little too early, but if you guy knows they're coming, you know, you definitely can get a little better prepared this year. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, another thing with that is it just, you know, some people were like, Oh, it was too cold or it was too early, but really, once you get into the summer months, there's really no good weekend where it's not on top of something. I mean, you have NHRA races going on all the time and division races and all kinds of stuff. So to pick a weekend that everyone's happy with is pretty much an impossible task. People will look for excuses not to go to right. something like that for some reason, but they'll, they won't care about any weather. They won't care about anything. They'll go to a divisional or national. I mean, at new media, we had like 115 stalkers for a national open and divisional weekend. And then the very next weekend where you could have left your stuff there was the class racer nationals for $10,000 and half the, half the field went home. So it was just, and the weather was, was great. Uh, that's just something that nobody's really found the magic formula to get the purists to, you know, try expanding their minds a little bit and going out, and run in different races now this nmca thing this is this is pretty interesting i, I can't wait to find out what these payouts are going to be if there's going to be like contingency you know the schedules and uh see how that works out i've never run one of those before and they're going to separate stock and super stock this year they said this upcoming year have you ever run run one of those uh i have I, i'm a little too far west i think um i don't even know exactly where all they race but it's um mainly on the east coast or i guess more east of me so I I haven't had the chance to get to run any of them though. All right. I'm like yeah, a, me neither. I don't know Jim Bailey, I guess, because I'm new enough at this, but for just a tech guy to come in and actually have tech, that's that's what's gonna help it stay legitimate also. Yeah, I was talking to Brian before the show and I I've never ran any of the races, but um I think it was one of the St. Louis weekends, either the I think it was the national event. There were quite a few um, guys that would normally come run stock and super stock at a national event that stayed and ran the um, uh, NMCA race in, I think it was Norwalk. So um, I guess they must be doing something right if people stay home from a national event and go run an NMCA race. So. Yeah, that's a good point right there. I think one of the concerns was, though, there were going to be no heads-ups, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if there would be any class eliminations, but 
I don't know. I think they need to start doing that. I think and at these big money races, have class, have heads ups, do do something to set yourself apart, maybe from the uh, NHRA races. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't have the answer, so I'm just kind of just well, the more myself right now. But <laughs> the more options there are to take our cars out, the more cars you're going to get. Like if all you can do is drive seven hours to a you know an NHRA race it's pretty hard to have a car just to do that where, you know, if there's multiple different options, it's going to bring more cars out. Yeah. Are you guys, Brian, have a good um, deal going on up there, that class racer Midwest deal that you guys have? Um, I've never got to run any of them, but, you know, up in that part of the world, um, that seems to be a pretty cool deal. And you guys always seem to get a really good turnout at all those. Yeah, it's, you know, they... They check weights, there's heads ups, you qualify. Um yeah, they're combo races, but I mean I think you can do a combo race, but you gotta be able to, you know, you gotta check weights and you gotta do heads ups and you still qualify off your index. Like it's a simplified version of what NHRA is doing, you know, when you don't have to worry about if there's ten stock or ten super stocks and fifty stock, you know, you just throw them together and make sure everybody's got the right weights and you know, enforce the heads up deal and it's kind of the the bread and butter of our area. There's a lot of cars here that do it. Yeah, I think that, that kind of just got started in the right area. I think something like that, I guess down where I'm at, wouldn't do as well because there's just not as many cars. But up there there seems to be a million stalkers and and uh <laughs> that kind of stuff. So, you know, and then those people usually don't bracket race either. So it gives them a good place to not travel too far from home and still run with stock and super stock cars together and, and actually race for some good money. They have pretty good races like that race at rock falls. That was, what was it? Four or 8,000 or something like that to win. I forget exactly what it was. Yeah. They're most of them are anywhere from two to 4,000 just depends if it's, you know, where it's at and how, who's all partnered together on it. Um, the neat thing is, is I, so I'm, this is my third season. And since I've started, I can think of at least four cars that got built just to run with us in Midwest class racers. So I don't know if it's so much, there's a lot of cars here. That's why the association started or it's good payouts. It's good run. Um, people would rather build a stocker to race that than bracket race. Like people are literally building cars just to come run with us. And that's kind of turned into its own machine. I mean, heck a small race is 50 cars, 40 cars. I think the the last race, I think there was 38 or 40 cars, and that was, you know, when you're worried about weather and rainouts and all that stuff. I mean, you go to Rock Falls, you get 100, I don't remember what there was, 110, 115 cars at some of the bigger ones. Like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, last winter I got a phone call from somebody. I forget who it was, but it was one of the uh, guys who runs the class racer deal up there, and he was wanting to put um, one of your guys' races at Topeka, at some point, I think the weekend of the national open. And, uh, I guess I just mentioned it because I, I don't remember his name, but if you knew who he was, I'd, that'd be cool to, I guess, try again this year for, to have one of those races down in Topeka to, you know, I guess let some of the guys that live further down this way, not have to drive, you know, eight hours to South Dakota or something like that. <laughs> South Dakota is a great place to visit, you know, <laughs> I'll actually be there on Friday. But no, I think, in, and that's the thing too, is that grows and with the support, I think you could grow into those outside areas and, and go to some more tracks and just keep keep growing on the following. There's just, uh, I think the other thing that helps it too is just the core group of guys behind you, you know, like with John McLeod and Dan and, you know, Charlie's a huge proponent of it too. I mean, there's just the right people in there too really pushing. I mean, if those guys weren't in there doing all the, all the heavy lifting, it might just fall apart too. You know, you got to have racers are good and racers will show up for the check. But when it comes time to looking for sponsorships and trying to line that stuff up, I don't think any of us really know what behind the scenes, how much work it actually takes. We're just worried about trying to fix our, fix our cars and win money. And they're the ones putting on the show. So they're the ones that probably need where the get the most credit. Yeah, definitely. I guess a lot of the behind the scenes stuff is, what counts the most. And I always see when I see a flyer for the race and stuff has always 
has lots of local sponsorships on it and as far as corporate sponsorships too and uh, definitely seems to put on a good race for the people that go to them so how what do you what are some ideas you have to bring in more younger blood into the sport like how do we get i don't want to call you a kid but when you're old like me kids you know younger guys how do you get them into drag racing and i think that's a really tough question as far as maybe you mean as far as drag racing or stock and super stock um well i'd say stock and super stock is kind of where we're going but i don't know if you just right yeah some of us aren't goofy enough just to start there like i did three years ago so i mean you kind of got to get get them exposed yeah i think stock and super stock is a tough place to for someone to like who's never ever drag raced to start racing because i don't know i think there's if you're just getting into drag racing i think there's better ways to you know get into it maybe start bracket racing or or um doing something that doesn't have the i guess cost of super stock when really all you're doing is bracket racing for the most part but i think it's just something you kind of have to grow up around i mean it'd be hard for a young kid my age who doesn't have a family that has raced to decide to go run super stock you know I, i couldn't go run super stock by myself the way we do now so um I think it takes a good combination of, you know, I guess growing up in it and, and, uh, kind of already being around it, but and that's just a super tough question. I don't think there really is a good answer for her. Yep. It's a tough one. I still believe though. A lot of it is TV exposure. You have to see it on TV. Like you played baseball. Maybe your father played baseball. Um, but you guys probably at some point watched a baseball game on TV and knew what baseball was. Like if you didn't ever see that and he might've never played it, you might've never played it. So people have to know what it is. And if they only, you know, kind of put us on TV once in a great while, like a lot of people don't even know what, what, what the pros are. So let alone putting us on there for one final round for eight seconds at the end of an episode, you know, it's not really, spreading the word a whole lot so i i really really believe stock and super stock or drag racing in general on the non-millionaire level needs to be uh on tv for people to see i agree um and i think stock and super stock you know has a good foundation for getting new people because you know it's the part i like about it most is you know it's a real car and and uh you know it's it looks like a real car because it is and uh you know, as if you're trying to convince someone to go run super comp or something, you might not, you know, they might not have anything to relate to, but you know, what? when you see a 68 Camaro or a Mustang or even a new, new Copa or Cobra jet or something like that, it's something that they've definitely seen before if they're into cars. So um, I think that that's a definitely a strong point of stock and super stock. And that's really why I was drawn to it is I like real cars. What are, what are some changes you'd like to see the NHRA do? Like, is there a rule change you'd like to see? Is there something you'd like to see them do different? Um, I don't really know. I'm To be honest, I'm really not too picky, and I'm sure what they do they have reasons for. But one thing I do like they do now is three-day national events. or in that, I, you know, I used to go sit at national events for four days, and I think that's really too long for one race, especially when – you can't just be gone for a whole week. So, you know, being able to leave Thursday night, if you have to, to go run a national event, I think helps. Um, but yeah, I think some of the things I might like to see now is some of the division races we go to now are two days on a Saturday and Sunday, or actually now they're usually Friday and Saturday, but I think a three day national event or a three day division race works a little better. Um, I guess it just doesn't make it as crowded and jam packed, but uh, I'm really not too picky. I, I'll go race anywhere. How would you compare like tech and teardown stuff this year compared to previous years? Do you think they're getting better at that? Um, yeah, I think. I guess last year during the whole COVID thing, it really wasn't too. They really weren't too concerned about it, but um, I think they're doing a good job spot checking and and doing all that kind of stuff. So. I don't have any complaints. You had a now. List. Let's just let's touch on the indie thing real quick. You you won class Superstock G Automatic. They sent you to the teardown barn. They checked all the 
all the serious stuff carburetor cylinder head did they check you know the boring stroke anything like that yeah they checked all that um <clears throat> uh, they checked all that and uh we probably spent a good three hours in there doing all that but i'm sure everyone's heard the story by now but uh after however long that was everything was checked and um was good to go and we were getting ready to start putting it back together in the barn when they wanted to check the wheelbase so they had us put all our stuff back down on the table and they checked the wheelbase uh two or three times and it came up a half inch short so there really wasn't any um, arguing with them or reasoning with them uh they measured what they measured and and that was that so uh we took our stuff and headed back home. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying that. That's, that's a tough break and not something that you should be ashamed of. That's more of like, you, you don't know uh, so many racers there after, after that happened to you, you know how many racers I heard in the pits and in the staging lanes say, Oh my God, I, I haven't checked my wheelbase since I bought the car. So I guess I better check it. So it's just you passed all the serious stuff, all the stuff that actually means something. So you got my you got my respect and admiration. Appreciate it. Yeah, it definitely sucks to you know go all the way out there and perform. I guess well like we did and have that, but it is a rule and and it was I guess short from the way they measured. So, but it's uh, we brought it right back and had it fixed within two days to you know their liking and and. Uh, you know, as it, you know, the rest of the year we ran just as good or even better. I think lengthening the wheelbase a half an inch might even help a little bit. I don't know, but it definitely was it, didn't the, help. was it the same on both sides or was it just a half an inch difference from it was, both sides? Our wheelbase was exactly the same on both sides. Okay. Do they measure like what center wheel to center wheel or do they do the edge of the rim to the edge of the rim? How are they measuring um, it? Were they holding it straight? Were you holding so, one end or what? <laughs> Well, I, I definitely invite anyone who hasn't seen that process to go check it out. It's just a piece of um, sheet metal that's roughly the width of the wheel, and they kind of eyeball it to where it touches the tire and stick a tape measure in it and stretch it across. Hopefully there's no dips in the tape measure, and the tape measure's straight. And uh, <laughs> I guess you get where I'm going with this, but, um, yeah, that's how they measure it, and I guess that's good enough for them, so. I guess it is what it is. I figured they would just step it off. You know, that's pretty technical, right? Like, oh, let's see. My feet. <laughs> well, Crazy. it is It wow. is cool that they're actually checking, and I'm glad, you know, last year we were pretty rough on them for not looking at anything and not keeping it legitimate. So I will never complain when they look at my car. Just like I said, I'm glad they're they're checking and doing that stuff. Yeah, I agree. Um, they can check anything anytime they want. It doesn't bother me any and actually i encourage it so um, it's uh like i said our stuff was running just as good this fall as it was that weekend of indy if not even a little better so um i'm really not too mad about anything it is what it is and we'll just move on that's right all right well i i do i like where this lonnie Grimm has taken you know He's really he he's going to do a lot of uh, research. He's actually, I think, wants to um, check data spreadsheets, see who's lifting to preserve combos and things like that. So, you know, he's really he's intent on making this you know legitimate playing field and making sure the uh, AHFS is really working to the best of its ability the way it was intended. So we'll see what happens with that, and we'll report on that when we hear anything. Do you get anybody, any sponsors or anybody you want to thank? Well, our um, main one is my dad and grandpa at our shop. And, you know, they provide the car for me and, and the truck and trailer and all that kind of stuff. And um, the two of us, me and my dad, and sometimes the three of us go around together. So that's our main one. And uh, Cohen, Stennett, um, Larry Hodge, Race Tire, Phoenix Tire, and... Um, Double Trouble Properties, which is a good customer of ours, and um, a guy that's really really likes racing and helps us out. So uh, with that stuff, we we we're pretty small a small team and do you know most everything ourselves. 
as far as getting to the racetrack and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but we do have some help and we're really appreciative of, of the help we do get. Well, awesome. We want to, uh, thank you for your time and thank you for coming on. Um, it's always nice to get somebody else's take on it. I'm trying not to get just stuck in one group. I like to talk to younger guys in the sport and see what kind of makes them tick and what, what they enjoy about it. Cause I think that's, you know, it's nice to dive in and see all sides of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on guys. I, uh, had a good time talking to you and, and, uh, yeah, I'll talk racing or stock and super stock anytime. <laughs> Before we go off too, we got a, I think we have a birthday, Allison Dahl's birthdays today. So happy birthday, Allison. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for listening. Happy to birthday, this. Allison. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of Class Racing today. Thanks, Tim Stickles, Gutters by Design, for sponsoring this episode. Give him a call for your free estimate, 603-953-4640. Uh, if you want a t-shirt or sticker for Class Racing Today, you can email us at classracingtoday at gmail.com. Check out the website. Uh, well, classracingtoday.com is the website that's in the works but it'll take you to our social medias currently go check it out follow us follow the show share it out to your friends thanks a lot for listening and we will see you next time class racing today have a great day